I guess I'll start by just prefacing that I guess The Matrix was a great example of um, philosophy through film um, that we were just discussing there. Um, so I'm going to kind of flip it over to a film as philosophy and, you know, my argument for film as philosophy, at least, and I'd love to hear your perspective on it as well. Um, so as we know, you know, film is an inherently visual medium. Um, so it, it lends itself to strains of philosophy that culture has forced into the visual sphere, um, most notably feminist philosophies, which which is what I'll be focusing on in this section. Um, and so when discussing the intersection of film philosophy and feminism, um, it's impossible not to start with the contributions of Laura Mulvey, who is a British film theorist, um, whose theories are influenced by the likes of Sigmund Freud and Jacques Lacan. Um, and in her 1975 essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, Mulby coined and described the concept of the male gaze, which if you go to the next slide, um, the male gaze in short is explained as the way that mainstream media objectifies women, shows um, showing the female body through a heter heterosexual male lens, um, where feminine subjects are shown more as passive non-actors, uh, secondary to the active male characters. Now, essentially, the male gaze sees the female body as something for the heterosexual male, or you could say patriarchal society as a whole, um, to watch, conquer, uh, and possess, and use to further their goals. And so Mulvey really believes that women are in fact uh, the bearer of meaning and not the maker of meaning which suggests that women are not placed in a role where they can take control of a scene. And instead they're simply put there to be observed uh, from an objective, objectified point of view. Uh, and this inequality enforces the ancient and the outdated idea of men do the looking and women are to be looked at. Now in film, typical examples of the male gaze include medium close-up shots of women from over a man's shoulder, shots that pan and fixate on a woman's body uh, and scenes that frequently occur which show a man actively observing a passive woman. Uh, so if you go to my next slide you can see I, I've put in a few examples of just stills from some movies that maybe you have seen. Uh, this is from Rear Window uh, by Hitchcock which you can see there are segmented bodies if you go to the next slide as well. The Graduate of course um, again segmented female bodies. If you go to the next slide, maybe you've seen um, the James Bond movies where we have the active male with the, the passive female. And to the next slide. More recent, um, the Transformers movie uh, by Michael Bay where we have, you know, the male fantasy or the fetishization of the female form. So if we keep going, um, patriarchal system, culture, cultural systems, um, make the visual, um, the visual medium of film really integral to feminist uh, theories and the philosophies that follow. Um, they really couldn't be done separately. Uh, so it truly is film as philosophy if we keep going into some examples. Now, films can do more than simply I think you can go to the next slide there, Dad. Here? Uh, oh, nope, sorry, you can go back. Uh, great. Now films can do more than simply echo dominant ideologies that I, I explained there. So while Mulvey's theory of the male gaze really pinpointed those dominant ideologies, um, filmmakers have since been responding and directly philosophizing through the very medium of their own films uh, and creating new philosophies of their own. So most directly is the philosophy of the female gaze. And as you might expect, the female gaze gives women a chance to look 
uh, women are the active subjects instead of the passive objects. Um, and while these statements seem pretty straightforward, uh, there is more to the female gaze than just reversing the male gaze. So uh, this could mean that the female gaze is not simply interested in asserting female dominance. Rather, it centers on these three key tenets, uh, exposing how it feels to be the object of a gaze. So the camera, the camera actually speaks out as a receiver of a gaze uh, and in a sense is self-reflective or it is even critical, critically reflective on its own point of view. It can return the gaze. So acknowledging that the acknowledging the male gaze and actively making women subjects rather than passive objects. And three, that bodies are used as a way to portray emotions and the film frame is used in a way that invokes personal emotion rather than just viewing it on screen. Now, uh, I'm gonna, I think, move on to exploring a film that would, that I would call the originator of the female gaze, um, where this philosophy was first developed um, directly in film. Um, so that, I don't know if you wanna jump directly to that. Yeah, I'm gonna do it. Yeah, there we go. So, okay. Great. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a film, um, one of the most notable films um, that uses the female gaze, which is Jean Dillman, 23 Commerce Quay, uh, 1018 Brussels, a very long title, which I will just be referring to as Jean Dillman. I don't know if anyone has seen it before um, or even heard of it. Um, but in brief, Jean Dillman is a film about a widowed housewife who spends her days consumed with repetitive domestic work uh, while also keeping herself financially afloat through occasional prostitution. Uh, and it's only when small interruptions in her daily routine occur um, that she takes some unexpected measures uh, to correct it. And so I'll leave it at that to avoid any spoilers. Um, but if you go to the next slide, so just to give some background, this film was directed by Chantal Ackerman. Um, and it was released the same year as Mulvey's essay on the male gaze, um, so in 1975. And it arguably does the groundwork for establishing and philosophizing on the female gaze. So rather than just searching for positive images and representations of women on screen, uh, filmmakers, pioneering filmmakers like uh, Ackerman wanted to intervene into the actual formal workings of cinema to radicalize the cinema apparatus and deconstruct ideological codes from within. So in other words, if you go to the next slide, um, formal construction must change, not just the content to create these philosophies. Um, to use traditional construction would be to, uh, and I quote, remain within the master's house as said by Audre Lorde. So Ackerman uses her camera as a philosophical and cultural intervention. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, uh, her change in, in formal construction can be seen in her use of what is called the pre-aesthetic. Now, the pre-aesthetic is uh, supposedly in and of itself aesthetic rather than being aestheticized. Uh, so Formally, in her film, uh, this looks like long takes and medium shots of Jean Dillman in her home with little filmic dis with as little filmic distortion as possible. Uh, the frame is really controlled by Dillman's actions and gestures, uh, and and her looks and importance is really placed on traditionally devalued actions. So the pre-aesthetic essentially values the image before a traditionally aestheticized image that we would typically see in movies. If you go to the next slide, um, you know, such as a woman sitting at a table rather than the actual action that ensues that we would normally see in a film. And so myself and others would argue that, you know, this film philosophizes directly through its use of the film medium. Uh, and it's undeniably important to film history. Um, now, that being said, it's not the most 
traditionally accessible film since it runs for four hours uh, and is in a traditional sense not, uh, it's a bit slow paced, uh, not to deter you from watching it. Um, but there definitely are other films which are more mainstream and accessible that uh, utilize the female gaze. But uh, when we're talking about film as philosophy and original philosophy as film, uh, it felt right to go with the originator where this was one of the first times that these ideas were discussed directly in film um, before or at the same time as it was written and discussed uh, in academia. Uh, and so I'll, I'll leave it there. We have a couple more questions to finish up our presentation. Um, so bringing it back to one of our first, our first questions um, after this presentation, we wanted to ask, um, so are there any films that you think philosophize through the medium itself? Now that we've seen an example of both, do you, can you think of any? Um, and also, I just focused on feminist philosophies since they are so intertwined with the visual. Um, but we are wondering if there are any other areas of philosophy that you think lend themselves to being created or extended um, in film. Um, or just any other general thoughts or questions that you're left with um, after this, this conversation. Uh, yeah, Bill, go ahead. Hit the wrong button again. Um, so uh, just to clarify, Megan, are you uh, saying that in order for, and, and, and I can totally understand this, in order for an audience to understand what's being communicated, um, they need to be put in a position to absorb it the way the character is is existing so for instance like basically are you saying um we need that female gaze in, under, in order to understand what it is to be that woman or to be a woman um that kind of thing i think some some people might argue that i think maybe more at least going back to some of the kind of radical uses of cinema, like what Ackerman did in this film, I think maybe less than just putting us in her position, which is probably part of it. I think it might be just um, these images were so distorted for so long or were used in very specific ways that she wanted to almost um, comment on it through the reversal of those tropes in her, the actual um, mechanics of her filmmaking. Um, so it's not a comfortable watch necessarily. It's not doing the same thing as a traditional film would do where it wanted you to feel that visual pleasure of observing women. We're so used to that. Um, the actual mechanics of her film made us sit and watch something that maybe didn't we didn't drive visual pleasure from uh, necessarily, uh, which is at the root of my, my argument and others that would would call her filmmaking um, an original philosophy or an original theory in and of itself. Could you summarize? Could you summarize the uh, what you think the perspective being communicated is in that film? Because I, I haven't seen that film. It sounds very interesting. Um, I don't know if I go four hours. <laughs> um, but uh, um, so, the, the, you know, you're talking about long shots of effective day-to-day -day life. Um, but what, what, what is being communicated um, in the film itself? Like, what, what is the plot or what is the, what is the feeling we're supposed to get, go away with? In your from your perspective um so i i would say that uh in in what it's trying to do is to make you watch parts of a, a life and essentially more specifically the female a female's life that 
we would not see in film. It is showing all the parts that were never shown. And it's making you watch it in a way that is radical in the sense that they're making you watch a movie that most people would go to for pleasure and saying, sit down and watch this. It's a narrative movie. There isn't a huge plot. As I said, it's mostly watching a, a woman go about her daily routine for four hours um, until at the end there is, you know, a bit of a plot. There's enough of a plot to make it a narrative film. Um, so in a sense, it is, it is a bit uh, comedic and tongue in cheek in that sense that it, it's playing with your traditional uh, expectations of the visual pleasure that you'd get going into a, into a film. Um, and when it was created in the 70s, that was very much an original um, original thought and comment that got people discussing discussing and asking questions that maybe weren't being discussed yet um, in terms of what we derive from films and how we're we're processing that in our culture. But is that I, I'm I'm intrigued by you tying that to what you call a female gaze. Um, what you just described is basically a slice of life movie. Um, and there's lots of examples of that uh, where that don't have anything to do with uh, a feminist perspective. Um, just, uh, you know, getting through a day of life is, is, is a common theme in some movies. It's, it's not as exciting as the, um, the road trip movie that is basically all male gaze movies. Um, but uh, but uh, I'm, I'm just curious how you're tying that to a, to a, to a female gaze or a woman gaze. Yeah, um, so that's a great question. I, I mean, one, one aspect of it is, uh, so it, how, would I, how would I explain that? I mean, the subversion of cinematic tropes is the one way that it's giving us a different way of looking. So it's giving its audience a different way of looking at, uh, at film and women within film. That's one trope. I think it's also been used in the sense that uh, making it self-reflective. So often characters in films that have been said to use the female gaze, um, you know, it's often will get characters looking directly in the camera as well, uh, maybe uh, asking certain questions that will get the audience uh, thinking about what they are watching at the time um, and what they are getting from the looking. So thinking about what they're watching instead of as much of the immersive effect that some films would before or the deconstructing deconstructing of uh of uh scenes in in earlier films and in films to that are still being produced but um that that would be just a few of the tenants that would be used that uh bring up philosophical questions not necessarily giving answers again but uh uh, creating that that type of philosophy through um, what is being seen, um, not necessarily what is being said. Um, okay, R uh, Randy. Randy. Uh, you're mute, Ed. Randy. I was trying to unmute. Norman. I'm sorry, I used... <clears throat> Megan, you raised some really interesting issues with that. Is to did uh, film change the culture? The culture changed film, or how did uh, how did it all come about? Um, but I am curious in that in that film that you discussed. Um, I was curious as to film is. I think film can be very effective in transmitting a message and getting a message through. But it didn't sound like she was focused on a general audience for that. So. Was she just sort of after the the intelligentsia, hoping to spread the word, or, or what do you, what do you think the strategy, what the strategy of that particular movie was? That's a a great question because I ask myself that question all the time as well when I look at some of these films like this one, which I'm thinking, you know, how you know it's a radical act in a sense. It's bringing up so many questions, especially at the time that maybe weren't being asked. Um, but who's seeing this? How many people is it actually reaching? Um, that being said, I think interesting questions that are new and being talked about 
you know, through this original way, um, they they have become mainstream because I, I don't know if anyone here is on TikTok, but even now, so it's 2023, this, uh, this film came out in 1975. Um, and I'm asking how many people saw this, but the term the female gaze, even since I've been out of university, which I feel like these terms were kind of relegated to that sphere, um, I now see on TikTok um, with high schoolers talking about it, with different people from different demographics talking about this philosophy and the um, theory of the, fem the female gaze and the male gaze and how um, they see it in modern films, in um, modern aspects of their lives. So, it, you know, even if it starts um, with this radical act that is not seen by a lot, maybe it does take um, that manipulating of the film form to get this, the bud of that philosophical question going. It is uh, at least one way that I, I've thought about it. I'm sure people have different perspectives on it, but um, it is interesting to see how it has grown in discussion and um, it is much more in the mainstream than um, this movie ever was in the 70s. Was it shown in universities and places like that or do you have any any sense of four yeah. hours of watching somebody sit at a table is demanding. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I wish I had an answer for you in terms of where it was being shown at the time, but I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't tell you that with confidence right now. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Randy. Manny. Yeah, so you were uh, we were wondering uh, what the message of the film was, and you said it was four hours long, uh, not accessible. Right? You give us a, a large warning <laughs> if you were about to watch it. Yeah, you remember what I said, but the I, I'm just wondering whether that's exactly the, the point of the film. She, she's dialing back the fantasy, right? The, the male gaze and female gaze are all kind of forms of, in some respects, a fantasy. And she's saying, there's nothing, uh, no fantasy here. This is very real, right? You're going to watch me and it's very real, right? Yeah, that's a, a great interpretation of it too. And I think to some extent that is the case. Um, that being said, I, there are more mainstream films that are, you know, slightly uh, more accessible that are are out now that you could say are doing similar things. But is it the original? Is it, you know, maybe we could even compare it to reading an original uh, text by Jean-Paul Sartre. Make it's maybe slightly less accessible than if we watched a film about his theories or, um, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, different method of getting to those ideas. So. You could maybe say the same about this film where sure maybe it's slightly less accessible but it's you know it's the original creation of these thoughts these ideas it's you know almost an original uh text source uh so is it worth going back to that to get these ideas and have these conversations that's up to you know who you are <laughs> and what you think great any other questions david yeah, David. Uh, off topic, off topic as usual. Um, I'm, I'm sort of, as you know, interested in the the nexus of biology uh, and um, and philosophy, and you know the impact on the brain. The kind of thing we see with long COVID and how it changes uh, one's perceptions. Um, and it seems to me that um, we're just at the cusp of virtual reality, where in fact um, the experience will be completely immersive, where you will then uh, it, ex have all the experiences depending upon what kind of apparatus you're attached to. And it seems to me that is a much more powerful way of uh, conveying uh, things. Uh, Plato, I suppose, wouldn't like it because uh, it relies on some of the senses. But I, it seems to me that's where we're going now. And um, I don't want to take you too far off topic, but I'd just be uh, interested um, if anybody's given any thought to that. Uh, actually, uh, John, uh, uh, David, I'm going to speak to that because um, 
I, I am totally uh, with you on that. Um, I think we are moving into a virtual reality aesthetics. Um, and um, I have a virtual reality headset and um, it is very immersive. And, you know, it's not at the point yet where you can't distinguish the virtual reality from the real reality, but it's getting pretty close. I mean, uh, you, you know, you, you are in the headset. It feels like you're in a, in a place. And um, there are all sorts of interesting questions that arise from this new technology, um, including some of the questions were, that were brought up, which is what is the difference between an illusion uh, and the real world? Um, well, an illusion is, is real in its own way. I mean, this is where Plato kind of missed the boat because he argued that what's in the cave is not real or it's le less of a reality. But, you know, is it less of a reality? Um, it's just a different reality, but it's not necessarily less of a reality. So I think, you know, what you, you're pointing out there, David, is really interesting. And it's, it is the, the wave of the future. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, uh, John, John Cummins, and probably this is going to be the last uh, uh, point. Yeah. Um, I, I guess... Um, you got a great daughter there, uh, Ronan. Congratulations. Uh, I do know it. Yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I appreciate that. I, I, I appreciate yeah, that she's I, my well, daughter. Something, some, something that you already know. But um, I do know that. Yeah. Um, I guess the concept of women being treated as objects rather than subjects is, is not new. And I guess the question I have for your daughter is, does film do does can film do a better job of relaying that concept than say radio conversation or theater or literature? You know these other mediums that we talk about, which are all mediums of communication as well as film. Does film have an advantage to communicate maybe this particular philosophical idea or philosoph philosophical ideas in general? Mm. I mean, I, that's a great question. And I think you could argue many sides to that. My my argument to that and what I would say, why I would say film actually does have an advantage um, to that is how visual it is um, and also how you can manipulate visuals. So I, I think uh, the fact that film manipulated visuals in very specific ways that, um, that really enforced these cultural um, these cultural uh, patterns that that were going on, cultural systems, um, the you know, film being so visual by using it radically in different ways, such as the example I gave, um, it's uh, it, it needs to almost comment on the visual since uh, we're talking about who's being looked at and what type of looking has been given power. So that would be my argument for film. I mean, other mediums are visual too. Theater is visual too, but is it as easily manipulated to um, maybe make certain comments or uh, create certain ideas um, is maybe where I would, I would say it differs. Uh, what, and what about say sculpture or great sure. paintings? I think you know, art, these are older forms that do the, try to do the same thing. John, I think that the power of film lies in the fact that um, it is so transparent. Uh, film uh, seems to mirror reality. And that's where it's got power. Uh, so when you're in a film, um, it's not really hard to believe that what you're looking at is real. Um, and you need to obviously ask yourself uh, the question, is it real or how much of reality is it capturing or is it giving me anything beyond you know, an illusion? And in that sense, it's got power. It's got the power of forcing you to ask questions. Um, other uh, medium, mediums also do the same thing, but differently. I mean, the, the, the power of the visual, the visual power of film is I, I don't think sur it's not surmounted by any other aesthetic. Um, it's it's 
you know that that's why people love it that's why television and 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 films are so popular because they have a a power of of uh, really just transforming us to to a place and make us think in ways that we otherwise wouldn't think and see things that we wouldn't otherwise see anyway megan uh, what do you think do you agree with that yeah i, I mean i would also agree i think uh i think art has has also tried to uh to talk about these ideas since then i but i i also think the dynamic nature of film where it's moving and it you can there's so much power in contrast in film in the way that things are cut it gives an extra layer of power to the images um to maybe ask questions um that's also probably a biased answer i think maybe some artists would say otherwise um but uh that's my personal philosophy on it um and i i, I guess i don't know if anyone with you agree or disagree, but um, I do think the dynamic nature of it um, does help. So I guess being such a young medium and such a powerful medium as Ronan argues, maybe the most powerful to communicate ideas and emotions and thoughts that it is potentially handled properly. The best way to communicate philosophy or the nature of reality, the nature of mind, the nature of matter, how mind and matter interrelates it might be the very best going down the road. Well, actually, I wouldn't say that. I would say that the written word is 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 excellent, but to as a support, film is amazing. Film supports. I mean, they all inter, they all work together. So you know, you don't get rid of one in order to make room for the other. I think that they kind of work together to to uh, um, give us more more awareness and make us more enlightened uh, so whatever can give us insight is is uh something that we should uh give room for and film gives us insight the written word gives us insight they all they're all important well i wasn't suggesting getting rid of a medium i was just suggesting that yeah. perhaps yeah seeing film as such a young medium literature such an old medium yeah. And it's standing on the shoulders, the new literature standing on the shoulders of that old literature medium that has a huge advantage to convey ideas, whereas film, given yeah. time, mm -hmm. might become more important. Yeah, well, I, I think it's already kind of more important in a way. I mean, how many people watch films versus how many people read philosophy, read philosophy? Um, you know, I think it's already got a lot of uh, a, a lot of credibility as a as, uh, uh, a, a medium for giving us insight and, and, and certain films do they give us amazing insight 